Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to session A. Um, it is a pleasure to have uh, Tony Metger here speaking about concentration bounds and limitations of QA OAs. Thank you and very welcome. All right, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so this is joint work with Anurag Anshu, and for the most part, I'll really just talk about this, this first part of the, the title, the concentration bounds, and then we'll mention QAA very briefly towards the end of the talk, but the talk afterwards by Leo will be a lot more about QAA. Um, so before I tell you how to prove a concentration bound, let me just, by the way, is the audio fine? It sounds weird here. That's good. Okay. Um, let me just tell you what we mean. We have two microphones. Oh. Okay, so I have to use this one then. I'll, I'll, I'll try to stay there. Um, let me just tell you what we actually mean by concentration bounds for quantum states. So we all know what a concentration bound is for a classical probability distribution, right? It just tells you that the tails drop off kind of quickly. And when we say we prove concentration bounds for quantum states, really what we mean is we prove concentration bounds for one particular classical distribution associated to quantum states. And that's this Hemingway distribution. So if you have some n-qubit quantum state rho, then its Hemingway distribution is the distribution over the integers from 0 to n, where the probability of getting integer i is the probability that if you measure the state in the computational basis, you get a string with Hemingway i. So the number of ones in the string is, is i. And this is really the distribution that, that we're interested in and the distribution that we prove concentration bounds for. Now, you might be like slightly worried that this is a very particular choice of distribution, but it turns out that usually when you prove bounds for this distribution, you can like generalize it to other distributions for observables that change kind of slowly enough when the Hamming weight changes. So for example, for QIOA, we'll be interested in some kind of energy distribution rather than this Hamming weight, but the two are, are very easy to, to link. So I won't mention this anymore, and we'll just focus on this Hamming weight distribution for this talk. Okay, so that is what a concentration bound means. Um, why might you want one? So this originally came out of more the like physics-y side of quantum, namely quantum statistical mechanics, where people use this to prove like thermalization of quantum systems. Um, but more recently, they've also been very useful in quantum CS. So for example, in complexity theory, this recent proof of the NLTS conjecture uses concentration bounds as like a very central tool in, in their proof. And as we'll see later in this talk, we can also use them to prove limitations on, on algorithms like the QAOA. So just to give you like a very sort of concrete idea of how you could use a concentration bound once you've proven one, I want to give you the kind of meta argument for how this, this algorithmic limitation proof would go just to see the kind of template and then we'll implement this for QAOA later on. So suppose you have some algorithm A for some problem P and you want to prove that in fact the algorithm can't perform very well for problem P. So think of some optimization problem where there's some natural notion of what a good solution is. And now you try to prove two separate things. So firstly, you prove that the output distribution of A must be concentrated. This is where your concentration bounds will, will come in. And then sort of separately, you want to use some other structural property of that optimization problem, for example, some kind of symmetry property to argue that in fact any good solution to the optimization problem produced by the algorithm cannot be concentrated. Imagine you, know, you prove that it must be like one peak on any output of the algorithm in point one, but then you prove that in fact there must always be like two equally sized peaks and that's a contradiction. And then you can conclude that algorithm A can in fact not perform well on problem P. So that's a kind of general template um, that you can use to prove algorithmic limitations from concentration bounds. Okay, so that's why we, we care about them. Now I want to tell you about the sort of technique that we use to actually prove them. And this goes via something that we call local approximations. So here we need two quick definitions. Um, one is for local operators. I presume basically everyone has seen this in the, in the context of the local Hamiltonian problem. But just as a reminder, if you have some n-qubit space, then a k-local operator is one that I can decompose as a sum like this, where each term ri here acts non-trivially on at most k qubits and its identity on all the other ones. I guess I'm going to call this sum the local decomposition of this operator. Ah, it's not unique, but we just need that there's some local decomposition. And also, just in case there are like any actual physicists, um, there's no sort of geometric notion of locality here. Right? So any k qubits can interact as they please. So there's no underlying lattice of, of any sort. OK, so that's an exactly local operator. We also need a sort of approximate notion of locality. And this is just what you would expect 
So a k-epsilon local operator is an operator that is epsilon close to an actually k-local operator. So q here would be k-epsilon local if the sum here is a k-local operator and the two are epsilon close in infinity norm. Okay, so this I'm going to call the local approximation to q. So these are fairly simple definitions, but let's just look at a couple of quick examples. So for example, if I take the um, project onto the zero state on the ith qubit and put identity everywhere else, so the identities are implicit, and I take the expectation over all of the different qubits that I could choose, then this is obviously one local operator, right? It already has this kind of sum form where each term and the sum here acts non-trivially only on the ith qubit. Um, we could also look at the all zero projector. So this would be n local, right? There's no way to decompose this thing into some sum of things that act on fewer qubits at a time. But you know, given that this is n local, I can now ask, okay, can I approximate this n local thing by some thing of lower locality? And a natural choice here would just be to take this first one and raise it to some power k. And this will give you a k local thing because you get sort of k mixed terms multiplied together, so it acts on k sites non-trivially at a time. And this will achieve some approximation error um, to this one. So it goes down exponentially in k, but it's not really, really important here. Okay, so those are just some sort of simple example, uh, simple examples of these approximately and exactly local operators. Okay, so why do we care about these in the context of concentration? Well, it turns out that there's a very sort of general link between approximately local operators and concentration bounds. And this is via this lemma, which is already kind of implicit in this earlier work by Koahara et al. And what they show is that if you have some pure quantum state psi whose projector is k epsilon local, meaning that there's some k local operator which itself doesn't have to be a quantum state, it just has to be epsilon close to the projector onto the state psi, and you look at its Hemingway distribution, then the probability that the Hemingway weight is larger than the median Hemingway weight plus the, the k, the locality from the approximation, this decays, or this is bounded by 4 epsilon squared. So really the like, important qualitative thing to notice here is, imagine you have some like, family of local approximations, one for each locality k. What will happen is, as you allow larger and larger k in your approximation, the approximation error epsilon will decrease, right? because you allow a larger and larger class of operators to, to use in approximating your quantum state. So as a result, if you do this bound for like every k, you get the usual concentration bound behavior, where if you ask for larger deviations from the median, then this translates to larger localities allowed in your approximation, which in turn translates to smaller approximation error, so smaller probability of observing this. Okay, so this is how, how the approximate locality of an operator, or in this case, a projector onto a quantum state, is related um, to concentration bounds. And I should mention that like, symmetric thing holds, so if you look at the median minus k less than thing, the, the same is true. Right? Okay, so this provides the link um, between approximately local operators and concentration, and it means that when we want to prove that a state has concentration properties, it suffices to just find a family of local approximations to that state, one for each k, and then we can just run it through this lemma. Okay, so in the paper we do this for a, a number of, of classes of states. I want to do it explicitly here for just the, the simplest case, which are the output states of shallow quantum circuits. So suppose you have some depth D circuit, where D you should imagine is like some small constant thing in, in, in this case, and you look at its output state psi. Then what we prove is that um, if you look at the projector onto psi, it's approximately local for these parameters. So what are the parameters? This Q here is just some parameter that you choose. It's sort of like the K on the previous slide. You have to multiply it for the locality by 2 to the D. And the approximation error here decays like E to the minus Q squared over N. So this doesn't mean like that much if you see it for the first time. But if we run it through the lemma from the previous slide, we get an actual concentration bound that's a little bit more intuitive to look at. So what does the concentration bound say here? It says that the Hemingway distribution deviates by k from the median with a probability that decays like e to the minus k squared over n. And then there's this, this sort of damping factor that depends on the depth of the circuit. 
if you set the depth to some constant, you know, you, you get a large constant, but in CS, any constant is a good constant, right? So this still gives you concentration that's the usual like Gaussian or Chernoff-like concentration. So you recover the sort of Chernoff behavior that you usually get from like independence, you actually recover from the output states or for the output states of any constant depth quantum set. So let me just say very briefly um, how we prove this. So the basic idea is because this is a shallow quantum circuit, there's like one tool that we have for shallow quantum circuits, which are Likert arguments, right? So this is what we're going to use. Um, and what you can fairly easily see is that if you look at the output projector of a shallow circuit, then you can write this as basically the product or the classical AND function applied to a bunch of, of commuting two to the d local projectors. Just how do you do this? You notice that the zero state you can write as the product of all the individual single qubit zero projectors. And then you just evolve every of these single qubit zero projectors under the circuit, which gets you two to the d local projector. And then you multiply them together, and this gets you the, the output state or the project onto the output state of the circuit. And then you can replace this taking the product by just taking the classical n function, because they're all commuting. OK, and once you have this, um, this is not useful by itself, but what you can do now is you can just replace the n function by some low degree polynomial approximation to the n function. And um, this is sort of has been known for a long time what the optimal low degree approximation is. And if you take some degree q approximation and plug in these two to the d local projectors, what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get a, a q times two to the d local thing, right? Because each term in the polynomial multiplies together at most q of these two to the d local projectors. And then the approximation error that we get here, this stems purely from this, this polynomial approximation to the AND function, right? So this first step here is exact, and then you just replace the AND function, and this error bound is exactly what the polynomial approximation to the AND function just gets you um, as a kind of black box result. Okay, so that's how we prove concentration bounds for shallow quantum circuits. Um, I want to generalize this um, beyond just shallow circuits to something that we call dense Hamiltonian evolution. And to see how this is a generalization of shallow circuits, let's first write our shallow circuits as a Hamiltonian evolution. And this we can do fairly easily. So what does it mean to have a, a depth D circuit? It just means I have a basically D unitary that I apply in sequence. And each unitary is a tensor product of gates acting on disjoint qubits. And now what I can do is I can just write each of my unitaries as e to the i times some Hamiltonian. And the sort of property that follows from this being a low depth circuit is that each of these Hamiltonians here is A2 local, because we look at two local gates. And B, all the terms in the Hamiltonian only act on disjoint sets of qubits. So you can write the sort of or draw the interaction graph of this Hamiltonian, where each dot here is a qubit, and then you draw a line if there's a a gate acting on these two qubits at a time. So this would be, say, for this first layer, this H1, this might be the interaction graph where you know, these two qubits interact and these two qubits interact and, and so on. And this graph has this sort of funny, like very disjoint structure where there are only like pairs of, of qubits that gets, uh, get matched up. And what we want to generalize this to is basically dropping this, this disjoint structure and just allowing arbitrary interaction graphs. So this is what we call dense Hamiltonian evolution. It's exactly the same thing as this, except now each of these, these h i terms, these h superscript i terms, can be a Hamiltonian with an arbitrary dense interaction graph. Um, the only restriction that is left is that the Hamiltonian still needs to be commuting. So we can also go from 2 local to L local. I haven't drawn this here because it's hard to draw, um, but this you can do, but it still needs to be a commuting Hamiltonian. So just to be clear, when I say commuting Hamiltonian, I mean like each of these h superscript i things is a sum of commuting local terms. But of course, the different layers here, they don't need to commute among themselves. Right? Otherwise, you could just like, use the product formula for the exponential. OK, so that's a dense Hamiltonian evolution. Um, I'd argue it's like a fairly natural generalization once you look at circuits in this Hamiltonian picture. But in particular, the evolution that QOA, which we'll talk about on the next slide, implements um, when you run it on dense constrained optimization problems is precisely of, of this kind. OK, now what we, we can prove is that for this kind of Hamiltonian evolution, 
we still have local approximations. So we prove local approximations, and as a result, via this lemma that we saw earlier, concentration bounds for the output states of dense Hamiltonian evolution under some sort of additional technical restrictions that I'm, I'm not mentioning here. So I want to kind of point out that it's like slightly surprising that this works, because for this top one here, there's a very clear intuition for why you might get concentration, which is you do the Lycan argument, and you sort of argue, well, you know, like, they're sort of almost still independent, and we know that if we have independent random variables, we get this, this churn of like decay, um, so we sort of expect this. Um, but for this dense Hamiltonian evolution case, like after one layer of this, every qubit can be correlated to every other qubit, right? There's really, like this could be the complete graph. There's, there are no qubits that have any degree of independence anymore, and they could also be like sort of equally strongly correlated. So this notion of there being independence that gives rise to the concentration bound, this really breaks down. And I'd argue that the like, correct intuition to replace this by is some kind of notion of, of just directly thinking about the local approximations, which you can still do for this case via some like Chebyshev and Taylor um, polynomial tricks. Um, OK, so this is what I want to say about concentration bounds by themselves. And the paper will also prove concentration bounds for objective matrix product states, which I'm not going to talk about here. Um, but let's instead move on to the QAOA and see how we can use this to prove limitations on its performance. Um, so just as a, a brief recap or brief introduction for those who haven't seen it, what's the QAOA? It's a quantum algorithm that's meant to solve classical constraint optimization problems. So constraint optimization problem is a problem of this form where you have some objective function where each term in the objective function is a product of L variables and you sum over them with some like weighting factor J. And your goal is to find the assignment to these variables plus minus one assignments that maximizes the subjective function. So how are you going to construct a quantum algorithm for this? Um, well, the first step is you should just write your problem as a Hamiltonian. This is already like a good start, right? So what you do is you just take your objective function and you replace each of the variables just by a Pauli Z operator on the corresponding qubit. So for each of the variables, you introduce a qubit, put a Pauli Z there. And then it's very easy to see that the maximum eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian is precisely the, the optimal value of the COP up here. Okay. So now you have a Hamiltonian. And now this is a step that I'm not going to explain. It looks sort of slightly magic if you haven't seen it before. You construct this particular state. So what's this state? Um, you start from the all plus state, so the equal superposition of everything. And then you do a time evolution by some time gamma 1 with this COP Hamiltonian HN. And then you do some kind of scrambling operation, which is some time evolution with some Pauli X Hamiltonian. So this one is in the Z basis, right? And this, this one is some kind of scrambling thing that mixes up um, the, the terms in the Z basis. And then you sort of repeat the same procedure. So it's not really, there's some intuition for why this is a good idea. I'm not, not going to explain it. But the hope that you would have is that you can maybe find good choices of beta and gamma such that if you measure this state that you get as a result of, of the algorithm, then with some decent probability, you get a good solution to your constraint optimization problem. And if you let the number of layers go to infinity, then this is actually provable. But really, the, the like practical hope is that this should work for a relatively small number of layers, because this is meant to be some kind of near-term algorithm. OK, so there are two like issues here. One is, how do you actually find good beta and gamma? And in general, there are restrictions, like there are hardness results on finding these, these beta and gammas. Um, but then the other thing, and this is what we address, is suppose you know, you've like magically found the optimal beta and gamma. How well do those actually do? And what we show is, you know, in general, not, not super well. Um, so I'm not going to give you the technical statement, but basically what we prove is even if you have the optimal beta and gamma, then for certain classes of, of constraint optimization problems that have some sort of special structural properties, so in particular they're symmetric, which means that if you flip all the signs, the objective doesn't change, and they have some so-called overlap gap property, if you've heard of this before. And there are very strong limitations on how well the QAA can do, even if you allow it sort of slightly super constant number of levels, a little over of log log n. So the kind of two features I want to point out here, which improve upon previous work, is firstly, 
the number of layers is yeah, it's slightly super constant. It's, it's, uh, it's at least a little bit super constant. And more importantly, this works on dense constraint graphs, whereas most previous work looked at COPs on sparse constraint graphs, because then again, you can do some kind of more explicit locality tracking um, in the sort of same spirit as Lightcon arguments for shallow circuits. Um, the one paper that previously already did limitations on dense constraint graphs is the next talk. Um, the sort of improvement that we get over this is, okay, first of all, the proofs are much simpler. And secondly, what they prove is asymptotic limitations on the expectation value that you would get. Whereas we actually prove some statement of the form, the probability of getting a good solution from the QAA is actually like a negligible function in N. So it's, it's really kind of terrible. Um, so that's, that's the sort of result for QAA. Just very briefly, like at a very high level, how do we prove it? We prove it using this template that I, I mentioned at the start. Um, we prove that you know, if you look at this, this is exactly a dense Hamiltonian evolution because each of these H's here is a commuting local um, Hamiltonian um, of, of this form, similarly for the scrambling Hamiltonian. So this is a dense Hamiltonian evolution. As a result from our general concentration bounds for dense Hamiltonian evolutions, we get that um, you know, there are sort of concentration properties on this output state. And what we can show is that if the QAA has like a noticeable success probability, then this concentration is like very strong. It basically tells you some, something like, oh, all of the good output must be on like a very sort of small subset of possible good solutions. And then if you have symmetric QAOA, so QAOA on symmetric um, COPs, then you can use a sort of known argument to argue, well, you know, if there's a lot of weight here, then there must also be a lot of weight far away over here by symmetry, and this is a contradiction, so therefore you get limitations. Okay, so that's just the, the high level rough argument. Um, okay, so let me wrap up. Um, the main sort of technical thing that we prove are concentration bounds for the outputs of shallow quantum circuits, injective matrix product states, which I haven't talked about here, and the outputs of dense Hamiltonian evolution. The main proof technique is always the same idea as what I talked about for the shallow circuits, where you just want to approximate your state by a low degree polynomial of some local operator. This gets your local approximation to this state, and then you run it through this, this general lemma. And if you combine this with some sort of additional properties of constraint optimization problems, namely this overlap gap property, then we get strong limitations on even for dense COPs at super constant level. So let me just mention two quick open questions. Um, firstly, the concentration that we get for the, the dense Hamiltonian evolution case is not Gaussian, so it doesn't have this like Chernoff-like decay, but it's not clear that it, it can't. <laughs> so it, it would be like the Chernoff-like decay is obviously the optimal thing. And it will be interesting to see whether we can recover this like optimal decay there as well. And on the QAA side, really all that we can say is for symmetric QAA. Um, it feels like it should, should still be true for non-symmetric QAA, but currently we just can't say anything. So I think there's, there's some room for improvement here. Right, so thank you. Yeah, thank you for that's a very nice talk. Um, so I think it would be a good, a good idea if somehow people leave now very quickly, and then we have the questions, uh, and then be. OK. Uh, so uh, Richard. Um, so you're worried about median versus mean, or? Yes, so why is it here? Can you comment on Um Not sure there's like a super good intuitive reason why it should be. Oh, so if the question wasn't recorded, and the question is why is it a median versus a mean? Um, I don't think there's like a super good intuitive reason for why it should be the case. Um, it just sort of comes out technically. Um, usually when you have strong enough concentration, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, the, it sort of matters if you have like distribution that are very far spread and have like peaks over here and over here. Um, once you have strong enough concentration, it sort of doesn't make a difference. Um, so no, in applying them, you don't have to be like super careful um, with the median versus mean thing just by concentration. But I could have two peaks, right? And one point in the middle, which is the median. 
Right, but for that kind of like that kind of distribution, the thing just doesn't apply to. Um, so it, it doesn't. There's no like sort of multi-peaked concentration that, that we can prove. It. It's really like concentration about a single point. Um, in the QAA case, I'm, I'm sort of slightly oversimplifying the QAA case. There's some like additional notion of like Hamming distance concentration that that's going on. Um, but yeah, we, this like multi-peak distribution thing we we can't deal with with these techniques. Thank you. Leandro. Thank you for the, for the very nice talk. I wanted to ask you more about the approximation by k local operators on the output of the dense Hamiltonian case. So you take the unitary evolution and you mentioned that you use some Chebyshev expansion or something like that. So um, that yes, gives so you like, an, like a local approximation of the evolution, right? But then you have to apply that onto the initial state, which is, I don't know, some pure state of computational basis, right? So can you comment how you turn that into a local, like how do you do the approximation? Is it yeah, possible so to mention that? Um, yeah, I can try to say it very briefly. Um, so the Chebyshev part is for the initial state. So there are two, two issues, right? The initial state is the all plus state, which is, as you said, a pure state, so it's not local. Right. And then you have the evolution, which itself is, is also not necessarily local. So to deal with the approximation to the initial state, this is where you use some like combination of Chebyshev and some powering thing um, to get like a decent local approximation. So you can sort of imagine this is like a refined version of what I had at the very start, where we just took the power of the one local thing. Um, then to deal with the, the Hamiltonian evolution, really you just do like a Taylor expansion and keep track of like the number of terms and, and the error and, and then you do a lot of bookkeeping Clear. and, and works out. I should also mention just for completeness, there are these additional technical conditions on the Hamiltonian which are needed for the Taylor expansion to, to go through. Yeah, there's some like norm condition on subset Hamiltonians, but okay, it's a, it's a bit technical. Okay. Anything else? Um, so I have a question um, about the setup because I know there, there were some previous papers also by by Anurag about concentration bounds on the output of the sorry of the uh, measurement of uh, local observables. But you're talking about Hamming distance. Uh, but is it like a particular case or you know? Um, so like the outcome, for instance, of like a magnetization, no? Like a yeah. So I mean, the, this like Hamming weight observable is not not particularly local, right? Because you look at all right. of the the qubits at the same time. Um, as I said at the start, it's, it's not really limited to that. Um, like in the QIA case, really what you want to prove is some kind of like, as I, I said when I, I talked to Richard, you want to prove some kind of like concentration in, in the Hamming cube, basically. Um, and and this, is, this isn't even like a very observable based notion of, right. of concentration in a sense. Because it's different in that sense. Yeah, it is different yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again and uh, move on to the next.